Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni, supporters, faculty, and friends who are making a real impact in public policy, business, philanthropy, law, and journalism. Today I'm joined by Elizabeth Spaulding, Chairman of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation and Founding Director of the Victims of Communism Museum. Elizabeth is also a visiting fellow at Hillsdale College's Van Andel Graduate School of Government and a senior fellow at the Pepperdine University School of Public Policy. Elizabeth is an alumna of the TFAS Journalism Program and we'll hear about both her continued involvement with TFAS as well as her lifelong passion for supporting anti-communism causes. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. Likewise, Roger, and it's great to be here with you. Well, before we dig into what are perhaps weightier issues, uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit about your background your father and your grandfather were both influential in Washington and in the U.S. in their careers, each in their own way. I did not know your grandfather, uh, Willard Edwards, but I do recall my mother referencing him often because she was an avid reader of the Chicago Tribune, uh, where I know your father worked as, I guess, mostly as the Washington correspondent, perhaps in other capacities, uh, your grandfather, rather. Your father, Lee Edwards, also a writer, uh, as well as an historian, prolific author, and professor, among other things. Both had important roles to play in the Cold War and beyond, using their pens and their voices. And of course, your father was the founding director of the TFAS journalism program that you later attended. So could you share a little bit about both of these gentlemen to start our conversation? I would be happy to. Uh, I come by being both an anti-communist and a conservative by my paternal line, as you have just described. And uh, my grandfather, Willard, uh, I was so blessed to be able to have a lot of time with him um, before he died in his late 80s. And so I heard all these great stories. Um, for over 50 years, he was uh, a reporter with the Chicago Tribune, and he covered every president from FDR to Carter. So such a rich period of time. And uh, when he was off the record in the living room at his house on Capitol Hill, he would also talk about uh, uh, things about, uh, you know, who drank what, who was good at cards. It was it was also a different era yeah. of journalism and and really of politics in a lot of ways. And one of my earliest memories of, of that is uh, visiting him in his office uh, at the Capitol, because um, many of the the bureaus were based in the U.S. Capitol, and this is when you could actually walk up the steps into yeah. the Capitol, and there was cigarette smoke, there was cigar smoke. I think there were some reporters sitting at the desks, and I was little, you know, I was very little, three or four, but that's one of my first memories of of growing up here in Washington D.C. and the surrounding area, and so he was. Um, just very staunch about a person is a person and communism is the ultimate um, repressor of what um, individuals are and of what a community is and what of a fam you know a family is and even a country just the whole bit came from from grandpa and then my dad Lee Edwards um, you already gave his biography but he grew up in that household and did say that he was a an anti-communist and a conservative but what really cemented it for him as an adult was after he served his time in the U.S. Army, as everybody had to do at that time, they'd had to do a couple of years tour, um, the men uh, volunteer uh, or, or volunteer before you got drafted. So that's what my dad did after college. And so he uh, decided to go to Paris after he was done and see if he could write the great American novel. Uh, and it was at the time that the Poles were um, uprising in Poznan in 1956. And then that helped to spur the Hungarians to also rise up. And it was the beginning of the Hungarian revolution. And my dad said, what a heady time it was. 
uh, to be in Europe and to be watching uh, and listening moment by moment and talking about it with his friends. And then to see the Soviets, the communists crush it after almost two weeks. And that's when he promised that he would do something with his life. Uh, you know, he would do whatever he was meant to do in his career, but that he would never forget about being um, for people who were fighting against communism. And I grew up in that kind of household, uh, you know, getting to visit my grandparents' house. We went almost every week down to Capitol Hill and had um, dinner and uh, uh, or, you know, Sunday dinner. So earlier in the afternoon and we would go to uh, the Redskins games. I'm a, I'm a third generation Redskins fan, too. So I don't really watch much anymore because it doesn't resemble what it did in the past. Uh, but the, um, the, that all laid a foundation for me that I didn't even realize was happening. Yeah, that's wonderful. What a, what a great way to, uh, learn about many of the issues you've grappled with in your academic and, and professional careers to have, have those two people in your life as, as well as, you know, your mother and others. You also did the TFAS experience in 1986, I guess at the time you were coming out of Hillsdale College. I was still at Hillsdale. So when I did it, it was, it was after I had been, I was thinking about this because I knew I was going to be talking with you. Uh, it was after I had been section editor twice for two different sections of the Collegian, which is the Hillsdale uh, College newspaper. And then I was going into uh, my term as editor in chief. And so for me, doing the political journalism program at that time was uh, a real gift because I was with other students, some of whom weren't as far along in their journalism career, some who were much farther, some who were at big schools. It was very helpful to talk with the people who were at the large state schools uh, where they were having to put out a paper sometimes five times a week and, and the demands on that. Uh, and then we were having discussions all the time. As you know, you were always encouraging discussion in those programs. Uh, so it was really uh, a great time for me uh, and the uh, the placement, though, at that time, do do the students get to find their internship now or do you help them or do you place them? Well, it, it's both there. We certainly allow them to find their own placements and some do. The majority of them, we place them based on their background and their career interests and, and what's suitable for them. So it, it does vary. Right. right. So so in the in the old days, uh everybody was placed. They, they might be able to say, I have an in at such and such a, an organization. Uh, so uh, I got placed at a place I didn't agree with politically, but I guess the reasoning was she'd be able to handle it because she's at Hillsdale and she'd gone to a very liberal high school and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, I had a, an internship at a Ted Turner funded organization called the Better World Society. And I had to learn about um, I was helping with the, the production, with the, the producer working on films and documentaries. And she grumbled every day, I'm teaching you things that you're going to use for the opposition. This is what she would say <laughs> in conversations. And I would just keep my head down and do my work. And then um, one of the evenings where we had guest speakers, one of the guest speakers was Bob Mary, and he was then at Roll Call. And so I got invited to, there was a little dinner afterwards and a couple of us from the program got invited to go with, with him. And we sat and we were talking and he said, well, how much summer will you have left after, after TFAS is over? And I said, about a month. And he said, well, come work for me. So it ended up being this fabulous summer of, you know, working for a place that I didn't agree with their principles, but I learned a lot. And then I got to go to roll call for a month and, and cover things on Capitol Hill and compile some clips and all that good stuff. Yeah, wonderful. And I know Bob Mary went on with, to a very distinguished career in journalism. You chose after Hillsdale to go to graduate school at, at Virginia, as it turned out, in international relations. And I'm not sure what their program is called, but uh, what kind of led you in the, on that path? I had been really thinking about journalism, but I'd also been interested in teaching, maybe in even government. You know how it, and when you're coming out of undergrad, you're not always sure. Uh, and so I said, well, I'll apply to graduate schools and see what happens. And so it ended up being the right time, the right sort of offer, all of that. 
uh, to go to University of Virginia. And then I said, well, I'll see how, you know, I'll do the PhD or maybe if something pops up in journalism or government, I won't finish. But I ended up falling in love with with uh, higher um, education that way and also the opportunity to immerse myself in topics um, and even to do archival research as I got to do for my dissertation. And so I stayed and I got the PhD and then I said, okay, I'm really, I'm going to end up being a teacher. So I am one of those people around town that's a, a lifelong student, a lifelong academic. And uh, I think it's part of why I was put here. And I, we talked before we went on it to record this, that you had done a research on your dissertation on Harry Truman, uh, which later you took further and, and published, I think, your first book in 2006, The First Cold Warrior, Harry Truman, Containment and the Remaking of Liberal Internationalism. A fascinating title, and Harry Truman's a fascinating figure in the Cold War. Could you talk a little bit about kind of what you found in, 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 when you wrote that book? So at the time, it was this was the, the early 90s when I was doing the research, and I really wanted to write on Reagan and the ending of the Cold War. And my, my advisor and the rest of the dissertation committee said, it's too early. There's not, there's not materials open. You'd be relying on, on a lot of journalism yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to write it. I said, okay, well, that's not always bad as long as we go and get our sources right. Uh, but um, my advisor said, go back and look at the beginnings, look at Truman. So he ended up being a fascinating figure, and to study the beginning of the Cold War set me up for so many things, including making the museum eventually. And I will always have Truman as one of my people that I've studied and I understand, and and it's helped me understand the Cold War from a long-term perspective. And as we know, you know, a lot of people will know about World War II. Some people will know about World War I because they are, you know, war buffs. But not as many people know about the Cold War. And that's the third big conflict of the 20th century. And then it's chased us into the 21st century. The legacy of, of it is around us all yeah. the time, including in the war in Ukraine. So this has ended up being something so important. Uh, and my first book was well received. And then um, I, I just built on that. Um, the topics that I've, um, I've taught over the years for both undergraduates and graduate students um, have revolved around U.S. foreign policy, the presidency, war, national security, religion and politics, all of these things. I, I worked on Truman and his um, religious beliefs and did it have any influence on his politics way before that became a thing. That was that was something that when my book came out, a lot of people said, oh, we never thought about it this way. And there had been maybe one or two articles um, over 50 years about Truman um, being a Baptist and this could be significant somehow. And did he have beliefs? And, but a lot of, and now you have all these books with people talking about how, uh, whether a president has a deep faith or not, you need to know something about it because it probably has some bearing on what he does in the Oval Office. Yeah. So even that, and that obviously connecting that to the, to communism and the Cold War, um, you know, there's, there's a faith dimension to, to all of that too. You know, when you talk with young people today, as I do in my work at TFAS, as you do in, in your teaching and the various audiences you get in front of, you know, the Cold War is, in a sense, ancient history to them. They view it as the something in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that then petered out. Uh, but as you said, there's so much from that Cold War that continues today and defines events in the world today. So we'll get to talking about what you're doing with the museum, which is one way of, of reaching the rising generations on this subject. But do you think that, you know, s students seem receptive to the importance of learning about the Cold War? I think as long as we're presenting it in um, a different, a bunch of different ways, I don't think it can just be one thing. So I find students can tune out in a class if you're just going through, and then we had this conflict, and then we had this conflict, and then we had this conflict, you know, if you're doing something that's an overview, let's say, of American foreign policy. So if you pick the particular people and the particular moments that help them to understand what was going on, then I think that's a better way in. 
And uh, so I try to do that all the time with a variety of audiences, because I also talk to teachers. I talk to high school students. You know, I talk to everybody now, uh, middle school and up, I'd say. Uh, I, I am I'm teaching to, even if it's not always a semester course. Uh, but another way, at least uh, my dad and I, we got to write a book together, yeah. as you may recall. Yeah. And we uh, we had each been noticing in our teaching and speaking that that indeed, especially young people were looking at the Cold War as ancient history and they had no idea what it meant and how important it was and that it could have gone a different way, which that's always right. The contingencies of politics and history. We want our students to understand that we want our own kids and grandkids. Right. You've got new grandkids to understand that. So it's so, it's so important. So my father and I wrote a short book because we, we also realized that especially young people don't have the attention um, for the same length books. I've been teaching a long time now and I assign fewer, you know, the same kind of students, but I'm assigning fewer books, shorter books, fewer pages, uh, because there's just not, it's a different, it's a different time. I'm, I'm Gen X They're you know, at this point now they're there. I don't even know what we're calling the ones that come after Z. Right. Um, but it's, I'm still getting mostly, you know, millennials and Z depending on the level of grad school or not. But so we did this book and we called it a brief history of the cold war and boy, it's been used. I, I run into people and they'll say, I'm using it in a, a college class or even a graduate level class as a supplemental, or I've met high school teachers, especially those at smaller private schools that get to have more electives. They'll say they they'll be using it as a main text. And then I've met a whole lot of homeschooling teachers who have used it for classes as well as for co-op. So that's another way, something where we put it down on paper or we get it to them electronically um, and, and it's, it's shorter, it gets across the most important people and moments, gives them a timeline. We did a timeline. Um, I, I think all of that different ways. Um, and then, and I think vis visually too. So with my work at VOC, I'm so proud of the staff there. They put out videos, they do all different kinds of ways. We have a lot of um, curriculum online now. And so there are many ways to try to reach uh, both young people and their teachers so that they can understand the Cold War, even though they never, they never even were, you know, now you're teaching people who, who weren't born at all yeah. during the time of it. I recall uh, I had hoped to bring a copy of A Brief History of the Cold War, which was published in 2016 to the studio so I could hold it up today. And I looked on my bookshelf at home in the office. I couldn't find it. And it just occurred to me where it is. And I'll tell the story about six weeks ago, uh, one of our alums had gone to Prague with his family over the holidays and his 16 year old daughter who's in high school in Northern Virginia got really taken by the history, the, the modern history of, the, of Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic and the Cold War. And he came home and emailed me saying she wants to write a paper in school on the subject. Can you recommend some books? So I did the best thing I could, which was to email you, Elizabeth, and say, can you give Aaron some guidance? And you listed five or six books. And I think I had all but one. And that was one of them, of course. And I sent them to him. We're having lunch next week and he's going to return the books. But you also mentioned one that I didn't have uh, by a British journalist who lived in that period at the time. I'm going to say Friedlander, but I'm not sure that's the right name. I went out and bought that book as well, which is a, which was a great book because I wanted to have it in, in my bookshelf. And so you, you've been a great asset just in, in regard to helping a young girl working on a paper for high school. And hopefully that'll have long-term ramifications. But uh, I will throw in my recommendation as well for A Brief History of the Cold War or by Lee Edwards and Elizabeth Spaulding, published in 2016. And I'm glad it's still in print. It, it, I assume it is if people are still using it. You know, you see polls today that alarm a lot of us where students say, you know, they're kind of evenly split between socialism and capitalism. And I think that's largely because, you know, capitalism has a bad name often because it becomes crony capitalism or problems, corruption, whatever, in, in capitalist countries. But they associate socialism with Sweden 
or uh, countries that really are not socialist countries. They don't associate with a system that led to 100 million people, give or take, dying uh, at the hands of government, uh, caused famines, government caused wars, uh, and they're, of course, continuing today in Ukraine. I even wondered yesterday whether the total of deaths from communism would now we add on to that deaths from COVID since this Department of Energy report suggesting that COVID was caused by a lab leak in China. Uh, but anyway, why, what, you know, what do we do about this misunderstanding that among American young people about what is communism and socialism? Obviously, the museum is a great way to address it, the educational work. Are there other things you think that we should add to our arsenal of arguments about communism and socialism and showing that they're linked together? Yes, I, th- I think, first of all, um, just getting out there that they, they are indeed linked together. And if you go back to the founding fathers of Marxism, of communism, you go back to Marx and Engels, they saw them as, as connected. They saw socialism as the, as the stage just below for full communism. So they didn't see, they saw it as on the way to communism. They didn't see socialism as something that um, was somehow market socialism or, you know, all the different ways that people now try to tell you, young people come up to you, well, socialism really, really isn't so bad. Communism isn't really so bad. Um, so I think, I think part of it is to try to help people understand the terms themselves. And uh, we do that at VOC all the time. Um, I find in my, in my talks with people that a lot of times by giving them comparative terms, so running through, uh, which I'm, I know you do at TFAS, running through, well, here's democracy, different types. You know, I always want them to understand our type of a liberal democracy, a full representative democracy that we have in our republic. Um, but that and then socialism, communism, how really there's no difference in the end if you're looking at it in theory. Um, talk a little bit about capitalism, talk about, as you said, the fact that the isms are systems, right? And of course, capitalism isn't a form of government at all, but that these are systems, whereas democracy in its various forms um, is indeed a form of government. And, and I just think there are a lot of young people that don't even understand the simple terms. So, so whatever you can do on that, whatever you, you know, we all can do on that is important. Um, and then at VOC, we have, um, uh, a witness project, uh, which this is some of the, some of what VOC does is modeled on the successes of the Holocaust Museum and its foundation. Uh, and, and we have the witness project, um, series. Uh, and in this, we have, uh, many documentaries. And each one features somebody who fought and survived communism and then is profiled in in a short documentary. They're under 10 minutes. So it means that people can watch them. You know how now that's gotten short too. You can't, if you tell your friend, hey, go watch this 90 minute documentary and then you're going to understand all the terms and you're going to, you know, and your kid's going to understand it. And your, you know, your nephews and nieces are going to understand it. They're going to say 90 minutes, forget it. But if, if you're seeing the story of somebody, um, I think it makes a difference. And then, and then people start learning um, what communism is and what it does. I mean, you know, it's the most destructive and deadly ideology ever, ever. So, um, and then the, um, we have um, uh, uh, increasingly curriculum that cover things um, and it's, it's high school curriculum um, but we also are working on middle school curriculum. So I think another thing is to try to get people earlier and earlier. Um, I'm sure you're finding this at TFAS with undergraduates, but I have found that students are getting more and more, you know, done or formed before they even get to undergrad now. So I think, I think getting, getting a bit down more so people understand the terms too and stories and films. If I had all the money in the world, I would, I mean, I would donate a lot to worthy causes, but, but DFAS. I would say, DFAS. yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely included and VSC. Uh, right. But I would also say, who are we bankrolling to do the, the films, the TV shows, the, all the different cultural things, uh, even the music, right. To, to help people understand. 
And then finally, I'd say on this, it's not only that they understand these horrible things, you know, communism, but the flip side, they need to understand what what liberty is, right? What equality is, what the market is, what um, branches of government and separation of powers and all of that too. Because if you only know the the bad stuff and then you're and then you might be starting to say you're a young person, okay, I really don't want that. You have to actually understand too what you should be for. Well, you're very you're right that, uh, and we have to start earlier and earlier. You know, in 2013, we took on the uh, Foundation for Teaching Economics, which is a high school level program focused at students and teachers. And we had close to a thousand students last summer come through those summer programs. And the focus is mostly on teaching economics and about the you know how capitalism is tied into human flourishing and it's just superb programs. And so I'm glad you're focused on that area. The, uh, when you say VOC, of course, it's the victims of communism. You first put up a memorial at about fourth in New Jersey, a uh, goddess of democracy memorial, which is fantastic place. And you often drive by there and see wreaths that are laid there by embassies and people who lost uh, loved ones in, uh, the Holocaust of Communism. And then there's the uh, museum, which opened last summer. And you chair the, the board of the museum. And uh, how is it uh, going? Are you are you getting attendance built up? Or there's the word being spread about it? There are a lot of museums in Washington, D.C., of course. It's the place to be for that. But you got competition as well. So talk a little bit about the museum and why people should visit. That's right. That's right. Well, everybody is welcome to visit. Please come visit the Victims of Communism Museum. It's on McPherson Square. Um, it's uh, um, uh, been great. We're, we're a jewel box museum, as we call ourselves, uh, because we weren't able to raise the half billion dollars or more that would have been required to do something the size of the Holocaust Museum. But this is our um, our endeavor here, um, and it's great. And it the permanent exhibits will will help somebody understand the entire history of all of the victims of communism. So you, so a guest going through, a visitor going through, will learn about um, the, the facts of communism, the basic facts of communism, and then that right away it creates victims and how those victims um, fight over time too. So we're, we're roughly um, organized around, around three R's of revolution, repression, and resistance. And so from the start, people will see that even in the Bolshevik revolution, there were those who pretty quickly saw that they didn't want what was promised wasn't being delivered and they didn't even want in necessarily what was being promised. Um, and then, of course, it turns into something that's entirely different from from the promises. Um, so we've already since last summer, thousands have already come through the doors. Um, we the word keeps spreading. Uh, so, uh, student groups are coming more and more and for anybody who's listening or watching and who is involved in education, please contact the victims of communism memorial foundation in advance. And you can set up a special tour. You can even meet with a witness. Um, we do that, uh, as part of your tour or after the tour. And then the, um, the director of academic programs can also talk with large groups like that too, or small groups. It's just if you do something in advance when you've got especially students of whatever age involved, that helps. Um, we've got, um, lots of regular folks coming in. You can, you can get your tickets online in advance or you can walk in. Uh, right now we're open Tuesday through Saturday, um, from nine to three. And so uh, we we are very happy now that VOC has been able to figure out how to offer some weekend hours because it's a small nonprofit. So some of this is staffing too, right? That are challenges. But we've got we've got people coming, families coming, all different ages are coming. Um, if your kids are really little, they're not going to get a you know they might be able to watch the films. You might have to help them with one of the films in particular. Um, but especially for middle school, um, all the way up. Um, and then we are also having a lot of people who are, who were victims, who are survivors of communism coming through. And one time I was giving a special tour, uh, to a dignitary and somebody came up to me and he started to cry and he was there with his son and he was somebody who had managed to escape Romania when it was, I mean, you know, Romania was never a happy story. Um, and he said, I'm so glad you've done this and I'm so glad you've done it for all the victims of communism. 
And so that's one thing that's unique about our museum. We're dedicated to remembering and teaching and helping people understand about all of the victims of communism. And there are many good museums out there, and some people probably are thinking about their travels and some of them they've seen, but many of them are focused on just that particular country's experience or perhaps a little bit more of a region. But at at our museum, at the VOC Museum, it's for um, all of the victims of communism. So we need to get the word out more and, and I invite everybody to come, uh, but, but more and more people are finding us, which is great. I've uh, had the opportunity to visit some in, in Eastern Central Europe, uh, and, and there's a range of them uh, with some good exhibits, but uh, it's, it's wonderful to have one here in Washington, D.C. We think of the Soviet Union, but there's Cuba, of course, which I assume is part of the focus there. Uh, perhaps you know North Korea and Venezuela, and of course China. I wanted to ask you about China. You know, there there were predictions by most, you know, Milton Friedman for one, who thought liberal economic policies would hasten the collapse of the political authoritarian communist system, and it seemed to, like perhaps that was the path they were on. But suddenly now. She has consolidated power and, and uh, is even backing away on, on, the, on the economic front, on the liberal liberalization that took place there. I've often wondered, was Friedman wrong or was he just, it takes a lot longer for that collapse to come. I talked to different people who question whether she's grip on power is as strong as it appears and that maybe it's wobbly. Uh, but Tiananmen was certainly, it was crushed and uh, when, when young people in particular tried to make change there, how, do you have any thoughts on what to expect from China over the next 10 years? That, boy, don't we wish we had a crystal ball that was accurate so we could, we could go ahead and find out. Um, I know as an academic studying communism, the Cold War and U.S. foreign policy, that I have been told by experts on China ever since I was in college that, oh, we just have to wait for the next generation in China, and then it will change. And then I've heard the arguments, you know, which you summarized about the economy part. And I think some of this is people are not looking at the combination of things of the culture, the history, the the country influences, the ideology, which has always been there. Um, and when more market things were allowed under the, the best period now that we look back at and people say, oh, wasn't that great? Uh, it was um, incomplete. It was often um, only to the benefit of those in the party, right? You had to be a party member really to benefit from it. It left, you know, it was built on the backs of millions and millions of impoverished rural Chinese who never benefited. So you've got a bifurcated system to the extent that, you know, more and more happen there in terms of prosperity um, in China. Um, and, and so even the economy part, it wasn't, it wasn't a free and fair market economy the way that, that um, Milton Friedman would want, <laughs> you know, when you used him. Um, and that you have to put all of these, you know, the, 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 um, the, the religious, um, there are so many different factors that when you put them all together and then you, you put your, your finger on it when you talked about Tiananmen, um, the Chinese Communist Party looked at what happened in the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union and Eastern and Central Europe, and they said, not here. And then, you know, this period of, of, of engagement on the part of the United States and others in the West, they helped. They helped the Chinese government. They may have helped others in China too, but they helped the Chinese government to extend its stay, so to speak. Uh, and and then you've got um, uh, Xi coming along when he did. And so this has been, you know, he's he's the most repressive since Mao. And when you're talking about communist dictators and you say, well, he's the most repressive since Mao or since Stalin or since Lenin, okay, it doesn't mean they're good people in between, right? Like Brezhnev, I would not have wanted to live under Brezhnev. Oh, you know, he, he did horrible, horrible things. Was he as bad as Stalin? No. But was he a good guy? No. So we've got we've to look at that period of China the same way. Um, for people who are interested, I recommend the works of Frank de Cotter, 
He is an yeah. excellent yeah. scholar on all things China. And he uh, has a new, relatively new book out that is on China since Mao. And so he's a, he actually talks about how so many things that especially Americans take for granted, well, China would have turned this way. China would have done this. And it's only Xi that's the problem. He, he, you, you read that book and he is based on such deep scholarship and archival research. And you realize, nope, it's, it's not. Um, and I wish it were still there, but at the, at the Victims of Communism Museum, our first visiting exhibit was actually on Tiananmen Square. So people might be able to find some some photos about that or talk with people about it. Um, but we have visiting exhibits at the museum, too. Right now, the uh, visiting exhibit is on Cuba, which you also mentioned and is still a problem. Well, there are some classic books. I'm glad you recommended that one. I've heard him speak uh, in Washington about his previous book. My favorite is long out of print, I think. I probably heard about this person through your father, but Life and Death in Shanghai by Nian Chang yes. about the Cultural Revolution. is, yes. and, and she's yes. someone we've had speak to our students when she was living, and you could have heard a pin drop throughout her speech. I was so grateful. I invited her, and she spoke years ago when I was teaching at George Mason University. And I said, can you read, you know, she was li living down uh, near Sibley Hospital. Wow. And, and I said, well, should I come pick you up? And she said, no, 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 I will drive out there. Will you meet me at the garage? And so I met her at the garage. I helped her park her car in the garage. And then this little old lady walked with me. And again, all the students, uh, you could have heard a pin drop in the class. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what we try to do with the witnesses, right? I bet, yeah. It's, it, that's so important, so important to hear those stories. I really wish we had more time to speak today. Uh, this is great. I, I'll mention that we have arranged uh, to bring our entire staff from TFES to the museum in March for great. a group tour and visit. I think your father will be with us and we're really looking forward to it. I can promise that this summer we'll be bringing through the 300 students who attend our programs on a regular basis to see the museum as part of their educational experience at TFES. So, well, my guest today has been Elizabeth Spaulding. Uh, it's been a great, I've enjoyed the conversation and thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome, Roger. Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfas.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Ream, and until next time, show courage in things large and small.